Today's episode is brought to you by the Rosenfield Collection of Functional Ceramic Art. The collection exists as an online source for research and inspiration, featuring photos of thousands of objects made by over 800 artists. The images are high quality and can be used with no permission required, making them a great resource for students and teachers. To find out more, visit www.rosenfieldcollection.com. This episode of the podcast is also sponsored by Amico Brent. Hi, I'm Kara, content creator and Facebook wrangler for Amico Brent, bringing you ideas and support for your creative adventures every day. Find your favorite Amico glaze at your local distributor. Happy glazing! Hello, my name is Kathy King, and welcome to the For Flux Sake podcast. I'm coming to you from the Harvard Ceramics Program in our fair city, Alston, Massachusetts. I'm here with Rose and Matt Katz of the world-famous Ceramic Materials Workshop, and they are ready to answer your burning questions about clay and glaze. Hey, Matt and Rose, welcome back. Hey, Kathy. Hello. Hello. Always good to see you. We have some really great questions. I have to say I'm going to do something a little bit different this week because in going through the questions with y'all, we found one that was kind of didn't quite fit a category, but I think it warrants a listen. And this question is coming from Annika. Hi, Kathy. Hi, Matt and Rose. This is Annika calling from the little beach town of Cayucas in California. So I know this is a material science glaze podcast, but I'm just curious what you three like to make besides glaze tests. Uh, Matt, I know you like to play with plaster and Rose, you used to work in the tile industry. Kathy, I've heard you speak on another podcast about your work, and it's really interesting. So uh, humor us. We uh, would love to know what inspires you guys as artists and a bit of your histories. All right. Thank you so much. <laughs> See, isn't Aww. that good? Well, I, I want to just first say that I do not enjoy making glaze tests at all. <laughs> and the only reason I agreed to do this show was because I said to Ben Carter, as long as I don't have to answer any of these questions, and we're going <laughs> to let the experts do this. But um, but for real, yeah, I, I, uh, I still make work, believe it or not. <laughs> but I do have a full time job. So it does get harder and harder. But I make um, uh, work that is uh, usually porcelain with uh, graffito carving, and I use a lot of content on gender and sexual identity. And I used to make big installations um, back when I was younger and had more money for storage units, but now I, I work in a smaller <laughs> format. <laughs> And I've said it before on the podcast, but I do have to say, if you all don't know Kathy's work, when when oh. I was a young ceramicist, because uh, I hate to say that we've both been around that long, literally, she was one of the people that I looked to as a trailblazer. Oh. Uh, and still to this day, it is some of my some of my favorite work out there. It is so fun and inspired and smart. And Kathy is just a great artist. Thank you, Matt. Oh, of course. But as far as us, I don't make diddly. <laughs> nope, don't make anything. <laughs> well, what did what did you make? And oh, yeah, well, I did a lot of different things. I, uh, you know, I was a production potter for a long time. I threw pots all day long for a number of years. I was a 
artist gallery manager for a while. And I uh, worked in the tile industry. I did my own work. I made mostly functional pottery with lots of loud, bright colors mm. and um, slip cast handles. Yeah. Slip cast handles thrown and slip cast. And, you know, it's, I kind of did a bunch of stuff, but now it's mostly like problem solving is what I really like to do. <laughs> you you were in the trenches though. I mean, like I I never went full time with with making making, but you did it. Yeah. Like as a production potter, you did that for years. Oh gosh, yeah. And it's you know it is it's hard. It's not easy. It and is. I was, it's such hard work. I, yeah, and I was just the one on the wheel throwing the the uh, one part of it, and then there were other the people I worked for painted and decorated all the pottery, and it's it was like it's hard work doing a production pottery, um, but I loved it. You know, I, I did it for years. It was a good job, and yeah. you, you know, it really it. yeah, it really like honed my skills. I could throw plates and mugs like there's no tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and she would. And and for for me, I, you know, what my actual history was is that I was a a, a cone 04 slip caster. Um, so I would make giant sort of uh slip cast sort of mural type things. Uh Rose and I can put some pictures up on our blog of some of the stuff we used to make. Um, but yeah, I, I, like I said, I got my MFA. I was, I was full in studio practice for, for a while. And then just, I fell in with a bad crowd, you know, those <laughs> material scientists. Oh my goodness. Those engineers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and now, you know, all we do from a ceramics perspective, I, and I do, I, I love the work, but yeah, we're, we're out there trying to make artists better. Um, and, and for our own making, you know, it's a funny thing of like, we don't make a mug. We don't make a thing that we sell. And it's so funny. Anytime someone who doesn't know ceramics comes to our studio, like, yeah, what do you make? And we're like, test tiles, thousands yeah. and thousands <laughs> of test tiles. Um, but it feeds what we do. Like I, you know, I got that question a lot recently, um, uh, teaching some workshops and people are like, well, but what do you make? And I'm like, I, I just make the glaze test and I absolutely love it. I, I don't, you know, sort of miss that production part of it at all, because for, for us every day, you open up that kiln and it's something new and exciting and it's something different. And like, yeah, they're all the same test tile shape because they're all slip cast. And, but I, I fire more than anybody I know, like, you know, our kilns are constantly going and we're constantly doing fun things. So it's, it's, it, a different it's aspect. always that scientific method. It's like, okay, why is this working? How is it working? How can I make it work even better? It's like that. I love that part. <clears throat> that part is like, keeps me going. I think many of us though wonder what on earth you do with all these, <laughs> you know, I'm like, why don't you make earrings out of them? Or I don't know. Like, That's too much work. <laughs> She's not wrong. <laughs> You know, it's it. Rose and I have fallen into the hard part of like, you know, we've got a career and we've got kids and there are other parts, you know, we don't talk about like we do consulting work and we do teaching and we're doing our own research and it just it, it eats up your time and that we just found that satisfaction in what we do. As far as the test tiles, uh, historically, most of them went into storage. Uh, we would photograph everything and then everything is sorted and labeled. This is why we've talked about on the show. What are we up to four label makers now, Rose? Yeah, mm -hmm. we have four. I think we might need a fifth one for up label here. makers. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think one disappeared recently. I think the kids took it. I found our eldest son was, was starting to make labels on his phone case about the things that he likes. Uh, that was just like his and way you, of tagging you, it. You burst in the room and it's like, dad, give me some privacy. <laughs> just me and my label maker. <laughs> it's completely normal. <laughs> We, we love it though. It's just, it's just constant discovery. And we don't mind the part of like it not being the object that goes to other people. Cause we think that our information goes to other people. And that's, that is just so yeah. much, so valuable. Well, and the, the digital documentation is such key that it's like, I, I feel like that's kind of our, going to be our legacy is that this huge library of what we have done with our career. Totally. You push the community forward, you know, internationally, I might add. That's crazy to think. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
Oh my goodness, yes. And people still write in uh, with questions like the one we have coming up next. We have a question from Ariel from Pasadena, California about body reduction. And Ariel doesn't quite fully understand how it works chemically and how it affects glazes um, since body reduction happens so far before glazes begin to melt. So can you go through body reduction, the lifespan? <laughs> I added that last part. I added that. <laughs> Well, I mean, the first thing that we have to talk about is the reduction process, right? It's naturally happening in a gas kiln where uh, gas to make heat needs fuel and oxygen, right? That's the basic components of what makes a gas kiln work. And so um, when you have a, a gas kiln, you can reduce the amount of oxygen, literally put less oxygen into that flame. And um, uh, uh, the flame will either go out or it has to find oxygen somewhere else. And where it generally will find it is inside the glaze ingredients. Okay, so that's the, the first thing. So this um, uh, process is then where is it going to find the oxygen? Part of the body reduction process, though, or part of the reduction process is that starting at a relatively low temperature, People do it at different points, and that's sort of up for interpretation. Some people do it as low as sort of cone 012. Some people do it sort of cone 08. But in those lower temperature ranges, they will push the kiln into that reducing atmosphere. So they'll take down the amount of oxygen in the kiln, and there are some other adjustments they can do to make that happen. But it puts the kiln in what's called body reduction. And body reduction is sort of a misnomer because you sort of think, oh, well, I must be reducing the clay body. That's the whole point of what you're doing. And the answer is no. I mean, you are, but you're really reducing, doing all of your reducing at that point. When you're talking about a reduction kiln, what you're hoping to do is generally change the colors of certain glazes or your clay body. The most famous ones are copper reds. They would be green in an electric kiln and celadons. They would be tan. But in a reduction kiln, the, the copper reds go red and the celadons go light blue or light green, depending on, on which one you're working with. And you do this in um, by the reduction process. Now, most people think of the reduction at the end. The reduction at the end is almost kind of irrelevant. What's most important is the body reduction early on, because that's before your clay and glazes have started to actually go through their melting process. Because reduction can penetrate melted glazes and clay bodies, it's just not as efficient. It just has a harder time getting the oxygen out of, um, uh, of those systems once it started melting, because it, when it's melting, it's creating glass and that's sort of a barrier layer. So we do it in what we call body reduction, which is way early in the firing. But it's not, it's not just reducing the body. It's reducing everything that's in the kiln. But here's the catch. Most of the rest of the firing, or I should say, stop. Cut it. Here's the catch, Ben. Um, so the thing is, body reduction only lasts for like an hour, maybe two, and it'll go from sort of your starting temperature, 012, 010, 08, somewhere in there. And most people take it to about cone 04. Then after that, they'll put the kiln in what's called neutral, which is not oxidation. And that's the most important part. It's not reduction, but it's not oxidation because all those things that you would re reduced would want to go back. They're happier in the original oxidized state. So you're keeping it in neutral all the way up to the end of the firing. And then as long as you keep it that way, the firing is done. You never have to reduce it again if you've kept a good early reduction and late reduction. On our reduction firings, we never go back into reduction. We only fire reduction early, keep it not oxidized all the way through the firing, and then it's done. We're done. Some people will try to go back into reduction right at the end of the firing, assuming that that's going to improve things. And yeah, if your kiln didn't stay non-oxidized through that long middle, it might help. But for the actual firing, all the reduction happened during that body reduction state. And then you're just keeping it reduced until the end of the firing. So that's why the body reduction is weird. Like that's reduction. That's when it's actually happening. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have to say we do the same thing at Harvard Ceramics. It's I, I was taught to put it in body reduction, then out, and then back to glaze reduction at the end. And um, and then over time, I realized like it's really just get it into that reduction at the beginning and then ride it out. And it's perfectly fine. Yeah, I was taught like body reduction, then you reoxidize it and then put it in there. But I always hated reduction firing when I was a student because they would put it into body reduction and it would like stall the whole kill now. Mm. It was like <laughs> you'd like be there for like two hours and it went up like five degrees. And you're like, <laughs> oh my God. So like, yeah, I always dreaded reduction when I was a student. But uh yeah, and now with our our blow is amazing. Like the reduction is is absolutely a breeze to fire now. That's the part that we have to add the context to of like, we're totally spoiled with this amazing kiln that is tight as a drum. And that's the big catch. Like if you're, if you're firing reduction kiln and it was built by hand with bricks and not everything's glued together and it's in a metal chassis and all this type of thing that keeps it tight, you're always fighting that kiln trying to reoxidize. And that's why I'm saying like, the most important thing through the rest of the firing is making sure it's not oxidized. It doesn't have to reduce, but that it's not oxidized because as soon as it does, you're gonna lose that reduction. So if it stalls and you have to start changing the air and the gas or any of those things, or if the body reduction wasn't good enough, but literally, yeah, I, I wish we could get rid of the term body reduction because that's the <laughs> reduction. Everything else is just holding tight until, until the end, right? That's all that matters. You can reduce in those later stages, but it's not doing anything. In fact, Rose said one of the funny things, we actually started doing on our reduction kilns, which is to flash it oxidation at the end. And that actually does help to make copper reds brighter. So our firing program right now is literally body reduction for an hour, neutral the rest of the firing. Then on the last 10 degrees C, 20-ish degrees F, I think, um, for only six minutes, right at the end, literally the last thing we do on the firing is we flash it into oxidation. And it it's this theory, and it, I'm sure it goes back really, really far, but the first uh, references I saw it are t- to Shane's um, Copper Red book, that it does make your reds go brighter. The theory right now, and we've had some students dig up some, some text that references, is that it's probably making the tin in the glaze oxidize, and that draws any remaining oxygen from the copper, Anyway, hmm. you know, all these sort of long, complicated things, but, but that in fact, for six minutes, right at the end of our firing, we flashed oxidation and the reds are brighter. And then we just let it cool down naturally. But that, that, that thing about just not letting it oxidize during the firing, you're absolutely right, Kathy, you don't need to do it. If your kiln is tight enough, if you fight with the kiln, you're going to have struggles. Yeah. I think it's because when you're young and early (laughs) and learning, you just want to fiddle with that thing. It's like everybody, you know, as they start to learn how to, and and we should say that we're talking about gas counts here um, (laughs) in this section. Uh, And, you know, you just like need something to do. (laughs) So why not just fiddle with the kiln? Like the air gas ratio, do, 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 do. It doesn't really need to be that tough. But um, I think you, you do bring up a good point in that, you know, you have this awesome kiln in the blau you know we have beautiful kilns too but you know as they age they they do fire differently and a lot of studios are probably dealing with that so it's not going to be the same for everybody but so talking about reduction in different kinds of kilns diana from sydney australia has a question about reduction in an electric kiln hi kathy rose and matt this is diana from sydney australia And I was wondering if you can create a reduction atmosphere in an electric kiln. I usually fire to cone six. Thank you. Well, if she's part of a community studio, no. Nope. Is the answer. (laughs) (laughs) Don't even propose it. You're going to get thrown out. Bye, everybody. (laughs) (laughs) Can it be done? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Should it be done? Mm, Probably not. Probably not. (laughs) You know, there, there are things one is, you know, you can make copper reds in an electric kiln by adding in very fine mesh silicon carbide, generally six or 800 mesh silicon carbide will actually make reduction inside your glaze. And that's pretty normal. 
that that can be done. As far as making actual reduction in your kiln, it, the problem is, um, you know, we've often talked about how, you know, we don't really vent electric kilns all that much. And we think that a lot of the talk about venting in electric kilns is sort of overdone. Oh boy, if you try to make reduction in your electric kiln, that needs to be vented like crazy. Um, you know, the one vent we have in our studio for our kilns is our gas kiln. That is vented because you are talking about natural gas fumes, which creates carbon dioxide and possibly carbon monoxide. And those are very, very, very toxic in an unventilated space. The problem is, and, and I've never done it myself. I, this is just through what I've read. Um, or will people will do things like an oil drip where you get a ceramic tube and you put it inside the kiln and you drip different types of oil inside your electric kiln. The oil will combust when it drips into the kiln, which inherently will create an unstable carbon that will then be able to pick up oxygen and it does do it. But I do not recommend that. Like right now, like warning, do not do this at home. We are trained <laughs> professionals. Uh, like if anybody comes at us, like, no, we, we are telling you do not do this uh, because those fumes are bad. Yeah, those fumes are bad. Not to mention all the the stuff that stays in your kiln. Like you're yeah, you might want to do like here and there one reduction fire in your electric kiln, but then what what residual stuff is staying in your mm -hmm, kiln that mm -hmm. you don't want there anymore? Like you can't scrub it out with a brush after you're done. You know, it's fused on there and do you remember the one time, Rose, where we were doing a burnout firing? And, <laughs> yeah. We, 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 we installed a kiln outside just to do this. We took one of our junk kilns, we took it outside to do it, and we did a burnout firing. And after the firing, the entire inside of the kiln was black. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've done from it. All of that paper. And uh, the clean out is actually okay because all we did is refire it hotter. And what happens is all of the residual carbon will bond with oxygen. It'll turn to carbon dioxide and it just goes away. But literally, we opened up that kiln and it yeah. was black inside. <laughs> yeah. I mean, same thing here. I mean, and that happens every so often. Someone's making a sculpture at the studio and they've shoved, you know, 10 tons paper. of newspaper in it. Mm -hmm. um, we, I, I've found more and more artists that are coming through the studio want to build and fire on uh, pieces of drywall. And though we have like awesome vents on our kilns, it still makes a huge mess. And, and the venting can't even handle, uh, we'll walk into the kiln room and it'll be smoked. The dumbest thing I ever did was there was a, a graduate school, a design student at Harvard who was doing testing on creating acoustic tiles with ceramic. And they really wanted to take a piece of like upholstery foam and dip it in casting Ooh. slip. I know, I know, I see your faces. Yeah. And so I, I agreed to just do this small, Peace. <laughs> and I swear I almost killed the entire studio. It was the dumbest thing I've ever done. We'll never do it again. We only burn out um, organic material, but um, it, it, it was too bad because it worked. It, it was. Yeah. I, I had a, a friend. This was, it was the nineties, everybody uh, back when I was an undergrad. <laughs> and Forgive us. It was the nineties. <laughs> what, what everybody in the studio liked to do, but I had one friend in particular is that they would go to uh, the second hand shop and buy old stuffed animals and they would dip them in slip and then wring them out and then fire them. And one of my friends shut down the entire Alfred kiln room because even though he fired in a gas kiln and those are vented, so many fumes came out and they were nasty because he was doing synthetic, like whatever's in like your, you know, the kids toys back then. Uh, and probably still now, like it was nasty and literally all the alarms went out. The building got evacuated. The kiln room got shut down. It's it's really nasty. Uh, on occasion, we have done like a smoke firing or a raccoon type firing by have, taking the work out of an electric kiln and moving it to you know, buckets of combustibles. When we do a sagger firing, we, meaning we put pots inside of a clay container with combustibles around it, that happens in a gas kiln, again, because of the amount of um, residual smoke that'll come out of that. And how do you fire that in the gas kiln? Do you just- Really slowly, oxidation? yeah. Yeah, just really slowly in oxidation until, you know, all the combustible burns off and then 
It's it's not great. We might do it like once a semester. And, and I've had other people talk to me about a sagger and saggers work because what happens is like, if you don't know a sagger is like a jar, you put the pot inside. So, you know, sort of a pot inside a pot. If you stuff that full of combustibles, they'll burn, but the carbon doesn't really go anywhere. So it'll stick around until it gets hot and then it will sort of create that reduction atmosphere. But it needs to be like, I mean, again, like our caveat, probably, probably our producers like cringing at us having this conversation <laughs> at all, because this is one of those things of like, seriously, don't do this unless you are outside and you know what you're doing. Yeah. yeah. And you know what? It's, it's interesting when we were, we, the kids and I joined Matt in the UK um, for his tail end of it. And we went to the Victoria and Albert museum. And our youngest one, who is seven, was really interested by this display that it was. Um, um, oh, my gosh, I'm drawing the blank on his name now uh, Emmanuel in this. Yeah. Emmanuel Cooper. And they they had some sagger like a display of how ceramics were made. And he was fascinated by the sagger. He's like, what do you mean you put stuff in there and then you put the whole thing in the kiln i was like oh yeah this is how they did it it was a really cool display but he's fascinated by the saggers he couldn't wrap his head around it <laughs> like, <laughs> like i don't get it why would you do that <laughs> yeah it's really weird because we don't do it anymore like saggers are are a historical thing when you were firing in a fuel-based kiln and like you're afraid of coal dust or wood dust or any of those things getting in so you put it in the sagger to keep it out. Now, the only time we really use sagger is in reverse. You put stuff in to keep it in, but the, the smoke still gets through, the carbon dioxide, the carbon monoxide can still get through. And that's, uh, yeah, that's no, no yes, good. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Well, all right then. Well, let's move on to our next question. And this is not about reduction, but about um, kiln furniture instead. And this question comes from Cindy from Ontario, Canada. Hello, Matt, Rose and Kathy. I was seriously considering buying, spending my life savings on silicon carbide <laughs> shelves. They seem to be the in thing in the pottery world and have many benefits. Glaze doesn't ruin shelves and they are lighter according to advertisement and social media potters. When I inquired about them at my pottery supply store, I was informed that they are conductors and are meant for gas-fired kilns, and they aren't that much lighter. Having just purchased a 10 cubic foot kiln with 26 inch shelves, whole ones to boot, thought I could, but I cannot, I was looking for options. Affordable may need to be considered after some searching, I'm interested in knowing about the validity of the information about the silicon carbide shelving. Thanks, Cindy. No relation to Popeye in Northern <laughs> Ontario, Canada. Okay. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> wow. Well, that that yeah, that's that's uh, conversation has been happening in our studio, uh, and we do use uh, some kind of hollow type shelving there. Um, for our gas kilns and we have a huge uh, gas kiln, that train kiln. And, um, you know, as we have an intergenerational community, uh, once you get to the top there, those shelves, even hollow, are really tough to get up there. So we did get some silicon carbide shelves and then um, we're going to get some more, but those babies are $200 a piece. So <laughs> I, I'm, I'm very interested to hear about how you could screw them up because I don't believe that they're like <laughs> Hell, all glazes and if you throw them onto a concrete floor they're not going to break but take it <laughs> well yeah they're expensive we we recently bought some too um because we with the the gas kiln that we have we we wanted a, a lighter option and so now our cat we can't pay for our cat's braces <laughs> <laughs> it's uh yeah they're they are certainly an investment and and uh you know they come with a lot of um uh, i should say it comes with a uh, at least a sheet of what to do and what not to do <laughs> it's a, it's a mm -hmm. lot of instructions for a kiln shelf um but they they 
are lighter than our corduroy shells. I mean, our corduroy shells are what, like five eighths or yeah, or they're, I, thick. they're thick they're- compared to the silicon carbide. Those are super light. You know, we've we've gotten some glaze on them and it's come right off. But, um, you yeah. know, oh, really? It comes off. It definitely leaves a residue. Oh. Like it's not like completely yeah. clean. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. But yeah. so, but the thing is they can crack pretty easily and fail pretty easily. So it's like, it's like weighing your pros and cons. I, I don't know. Like they're not end all go with those. Mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. for our kiln programming, I'm pretty ruthless. I cut out every stop and slow down. I, you know, I go up, I go down. On our gas kiln, our kiln installer, <clears throat> when he put together the initial program, the one thing he did was a slower cooling on the higher temperatures on the gas kiln. And it was specifically because we had the silicon carbide shells. And he's like, I've seen these crack if you kill, if you cool them too quickly. And I haven't touched it. Like the way up, I'll go rocket fast. But he was like, oh, be careful on the cooling. Yeah. And if they crack, they're they're done. You, you can't. You can't use them again once they're cracked. So now they're kibbles and shelf bits. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) But I will say um, they are light. We haven't washed them. There is a rumor out there that you can't wash them. If you go to Advancer, who's one of the big manufacturers, they do say that you can wash them if you want an extra layer of protection. We have not washed ours. The glaze does come off, but it definitely leaves like a little, a little spot of residue. It's not like completely clean. Um, but they are light. Um, You get more room in the kiln because your shelves aren't as thick. Um, I I like them. I think it's fair to say that we're going to buy a new electric kiln in the not too distant future. And I think we'll probably put the silicon carbide shelves in that one too and move away. Now I'll say, so Rose mentioned a word for the old style shelves and those are cordierite. And that's the type of material that old style kiln shelves are made of. This is purely my paranoia. This is based on no fact whatsoever. But (laughs) cordierite cordierite (laughs) shelves are made of talc. Um, That is a major ingredient of what's going in them. And I am starting to wonder whether there are going to be issues with cordierite accessibility in the not too distant future because the talc mines are closing and if you, you you can't fake it without the talc. So that's one question of, I, I don't know. This is literally based on nothing. This is just my speculation, except that cordyrite is mostly talc. That's interesting. I didn't even think of that for the talc issue. Yeah, huh. yeah. Um, but I will say, uh, uh, Cindy did say that they are conductors and whether or not they're for electric kilns. Uh, they, they are conductors. Silicon carbide is a conductor. And if you go to... I forget what the name of the website is. We'll have to dig it up and put it in the show notes. But there's a website that says to represent Advancer. It's sort of a janky website. Doesn't look all great. Uh, It it hasn't been updated in probably 10 years uh, because there's a Google (laughs) Plus link on it, which hasn't existed in 10 years. Um, But um, they they do make shelves explicitly for electric kilns. They make hexagonal shelves, which you don't put in a gas kiln. Hexagonal shelves are for electric kilns because that's the way you build them. They do say on their website that yes, the shelves are conductors, and but you absolutely can put them in electric kilns. The problem is that if you've got elements that are hanging out and they come into contact with the shells, then they will be conductors. And, and so much so that there actually is a type of, of heating element that they put in really high temperature kilns called glow bars, which are silicon carbide. So you literally can make a kiln element out of silicon carbide. But so, yeah, if you've got the hangers, you know, when your elements start to like get all fumbly and janky and fall out of their grooves, you need to make sure that they are not touching where the kiln shells go because that will become a conductor and that is unsafe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's um, the website is kilnshelf.com. There you go. So for, for Cindy, I mean, as long as Cindy's electric kiln doesn't have droopiness going on um, and she wants to weigh the cost of chiropractic care with the cost of <laughs> getting these shells. It sounds like, Cindy, you could go for it. Just avoid the droopers. Yeah, I really like yeah. them. I like them a lot, um, but they are, I mean, seriously, like, yeah, it's, they are expensive. They are an investment, but especially you're going to do electric kiln. That's a lot of back labor. That's a lot mm-hmm, of stress. Mm-hmm, lift it, it up and down and 
it, it's pro it, 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 we'll, we're going to do it. I think for our next kill, even though we're still going through the Cordyroid shelves as I break them. <laughs> I just say it's just a matter of time before we switch over completely. But yeah, I mean, they are, they are so much thinner and so much lighter. Yeah, and easy to clean. Mm -hmm. Well, all right. Well, when we get ours, I'm going to have to like lock them up or something, have people sign something before <laughs> they take them out. Sign the waiver. Like if the... they crack them, they get a deposit. <laughs> exactly. You know, unrefundable exactly. deposit. <laughs> oh my goodness. All right, y'all. Well, this is all we had for today. So thank you so much. Well, thank you, Kathy. Yeah. Thanks, Gabby. That was fun. Bye. Well, folks, that's it for this week's episode of For Flux Sake. I'd like to thank the listeners who submitted questions this week. And if you want your question answered on the show, shoot us an email at forfluxsakepodcast at gmail.com. So join us next time. And when in your studio, remember what Rose always says. Always remember to test, test, test. This is a test of the emergency glaze system. Beep. Hey, this is Brooks Oliver, an artist and board member at the Archie Bray Foundation. We are looking for nominations for our board and invite you to self-nominate or suggest a friend. We are looking for nominees that are creative thinkers who are committed to community and promoting, celebrating, and sustaining the ceramic arts. You can find more information about our open call by searching Board of Directors at archiebray.org. This podcast is a production of the Brickyard Network, an extension of the Archie Bray Foundation for the Ceramic Arts. To find out more about our lineup of ceramic podcasts, visit brickyardnetwork.org.